Welcome. This is the August 8th Beehive Production User Call. We have Jan, Andrew, Hans, Emil, Mark, and Eva, and myself. Uh, there is a lot going on, lots of news to share. Uh, a quick point from a recent call, Jan has advanced his proof of concept of executable jail.conf uh, scripts that will generate syntax from whatever your data source is, be it a database or otherwise. Uh, Jan, anything to add at this point, or should we just uh, wait patiently for more on that? Um, I will turn it into a review uh, this week, but um, the general idea is, for example, that you can have a directory with a subdirectory for each jail and then a shell script in like five lines to turn emit the boilerplate to define a jail block for each directory so that the jail name is derived from the directory name. Cool. Uh, any questions for you on at this time? It's totally appropriate for Tuesday's jail call. Okay, well, uh, let's watch for that. That's awesome not to cut you off. Uh, we'll go kind of chronologically here. Emil, you have a vert IOFS update. You seem to have hit a snag or two. Uh, yeah, I've hit a couple bugs, uh, mainly uh, in the way that we come essentially handling various virt IOFS host servers. Some of them don't really send the right error values, for example. So, you know, our local few subsystem gets confused, but I'm ironing those out. In general, I think that we, like after I, I upload, we should do, I, I'd like, like if people are interested in using this, I'd like to know their setup so I can get the corresponding virt IOFS servers and kind of run the code against them. Like for example, yeah, like the, I think the Rust and the C vert IOFS codes, uh, code in uh, vert manager from Linux mm -hmm. behave differently in subtle ways. Uh, which ones do you have within reach or only your own? Uh, right now I'm using the, I'm using a Linux host, the Debian host, it's mm -hmm. 6.1. It's, it's using a vert IOFS D but it's using the Rust version. Uh, they rewrote the entire thing in Rust, I think a couple of years ago. Oh, interesting. I'm not okay. sure. Yeah. So they have two to choose from, so that may itself bring some surprises on one platform. Yeah, uh, I think that the C server has been deprecated, but I'm not sure exactly what the status is. Like if, because I am using a vert manager, which I think is pretty standard on Linux to run, uh, on the host. And it seems like vert manager, the version of the vert IOFS server running in the vert manager is sadly different from the one that um, I downloaded from the from the vert IOFS website, basically. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's different versions, if one of them is the C version and the other one is the Rust one, but I'm looking into it. What kind of differences are you seeing? Like syntax or performance or? Uh, mainly behavior, like for for example, the like the one I'm using right now is sending the wrong error values, like when a, a, when it hasn't implemented something. So it's sending e inval instead of in OSIS. And the logic I had for handling uh, essentially error, you know, the uh, for parsing the error inside the ticket was being confused because when we hmm. see that the yeah, like normally Fuse has code for finding out that the server does not implement a certain uh, VFS, VFS method and then stops using it. But if the server isn't sending us Enosis and it's sending us something random, then we don't know to stop it, to stop like going for that method. Got it. Um, that said, do we have any other Vert IOFS users within reach or are you a resident expert? Well, uh, keep it coming. It is quite exciting that I believe uh, Microsoft WSL is using Vert IOFS, and that may open the doors to say uh, WSL, WSF FreeBSD. So, uh, I, I think Microsoft. Yeah. I think Microsoft actually it's a it's a proprietary spin on it. It's not precisely the same as Vert IOFS. I think there's like a WSLFS that's similar and also uses 9P. Yeah, it's by, based on 9P, if I remember correctly. Hmm. It's well, they, with a few they extensions. All are, right? 
Vit IOFS is, is not based on NP. No, it's related, no. but different. And they, they've been ping-ponging between apparently recently blocked devices full circle, but uh, I would hope the clients that are within WSL reveal some of what they're doing differently. Cool. Keep up the good work. Anything else on Vert IOFS, Emil? Uh, no, nothing uh, right now. Uh, hopefully, after I'm done with the, the bug fixing, I'll be able to upload the the code. Like the code already works up to up uh, up to a point. Like uh, I can share it in my my tree if anybody would like to experiment with it. Uh, it might be in the last uh, meeting minutes, but go ahead and drop it in the chat. I'll find. Let's just drop it in the document there. Any questions for Emil? Okay, going chronologically, Mark, welcome. You have a NoVNC update? Yeah, so the last time I was on the call, the mm -hmm. NoVNC issue came up. And so I I started looking into it. Uh, the reality is that Beehive currently only supports um, RGB in 32-bit mode uh, and doesn't, doesn't allow for any changes to that. No VNC is actually requesting BGR, and so I have a I have a quick patch that um, will when it when it detects that it will uh, put it in the correct order that uh, No VNC needs. Um, but the other the other aspect of it that I realized while while debugging it is that No VNC uh, doesn't support the um, Zlib protocol for com compression. Therefore, it will always go to raw mode, which creates a you know a ton of data uh, going yeah. between between there. So I started looking into you know what would it take to to support a different scheme inside the Beehive versus um, you know maybe a patch to no VNC to support Zlib. Uh, so that 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 work is still ongoing. Okay, and was that VGR mode that supported? I that could be a uh, no uh, BGR. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So What's it's reversing the, the the red and blue channels. Oh right, it's okay. the channel order within each pixel. Got it. That's really exciting. That would be uh, that would be great benefit because you know you have to be so specific about VNC settings it's kind of hard to teach staff how to use it what I would have been doing is just put a jail with X on each of my data in each of my data centers so that somebody can you know use raw mode without trouble and then use compressed VNC to get to that so VNC and VNC um, which is a uh, uh, clunky <laughs> We, I, I'm sure all, we all do that. We all have to do something like that. To... I mean, for ease of consumption, maybe there's a something to the idea of building a special purpose uh, shared library support so that you can bring your own transport and then, I don't know, have an H.264 encoder and turn it into a stream you can easily watch in a browser. Uh, did you say RDP? We could have an RDP plugin, so we have totally native. No, not RDP. <laughs> I know, but I, that's eyes on the prize. That's one I would love to see. Uh, RDP is such a bloated protocol. Well, it's a Could. really popular bloated protocol. I mean, it's I mean probably... compared to what? Uh, popular? Uh, spice? No, I'm, no, <laughs> no. I mean, bloated compared to what? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Jan, you can answer that. Well, I even VNC, at least the subset you need. Um, I wouldn't say it's bloated compared to VNC. I would say that it's, I, I would say more that it's more feature rich, which results in more efficient transport. VNC transport kind of sucks. I know. Because it is simplistic. Is my preferred option is to just not have VNC instead use the serial console and never bother with a video console. But if you well, want to, well, yeah, yeah, but we're using, we're using Beehive. We're using Beehive because our the operating systems are hostile. 
<laughs> you know, yeah, if we if we but, could use all jail and uh, zones, yeah, then. Uh, I mean, but any halfway saying Linux distribution, all the BSDs can just run with a serial console, even if you have to do a little bit of setup. Okay, uh, let's focus yeah. on Mark's work. Mark, uh, is this feedback helpful? Do we have questions for Mark? Any the, the feedback is helpful. I, I will point out that I did track down uh, TrueNAS that has a patch set to allow for uh, importing libraries that support a, a richer set of VNC. I, I don't know that that's, I don't know that there's ongoing work still going going on with it. And it, it's unclear whether we would want to uh, have a patch set going into FreeBSD to support that. But right. I, I recall I them having a GPL plugin that was a lot faster than the built-in one. Does that ring a bell? So there, there, there was both a GPL version and then there, there was a uh, patch to allow for, um, well, how do I say this? I think that the library is GPL. The patch set that could go into Beehive would then load that in. Yeah, that sounds uh, right. Hmm. Uh, do you have a link to that by chance? Is it just sitting in a, an IX repo or something? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll post it in oh. the chat. Awesome. Track it. OK, any other questions regarding uh, VNC and friends for Mark? Uh, do keep at it. That's awesome. Thank you. I look forward to your link. And Hans, just to punch through that topic super quickly, uh, did you get my mail? Uh, Daniel, are you still game to help out Hans move forward with, say, TPME? Let's all hook each other up with this. Sure. What do you need? Sweet. Uh, if anything, I'm not here to play middleman. Hans, uh, are we able to, say, send... Uh, financial love your way over some nifty channel of choice, be it. Oh. Yes. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and mail me that, and I will share. Uh, yeah, uh, cash, equipment, weapons, what do you need? Exactly, I know. Uh, for context, Hans has uh, found time and built a statement of work for TPM emulation. Some of the groundwork is in place and uh, we, a general conclusion is this will not happen on its own. So I've said, hey, we will get you whatever we can and spread the word. So uh, Andrew, uh, that's something that came up in, con in the context of your amazing organization. So let's just generally have that conversation to have it Going forward, I have put some things on bsdfund.org to say, hey, these are hot topics. Um, Hans, anything else relating to that? Sorry about the fire hose of context. Can you all hear me? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hello. Good. Okay. I'm that. So, um, so I've, I've looked at what's there already and um, Basically, writing that interface to a software TPM um, can be done in a reasonable time. The question is, um, how much testing do we want to? Spend, how much time what do we want to spend on it? Testing on it, do we want to test it with FreeBSD only as a guest and just assume that it'll, it'll work with Windows, um, or do we do we want to go the the extra mile and test Windows to whatever extent is possible? Uh, I would say um, whatever the shortest path is to a proof of concept to get interest in it, you will like the that. Proof would basically be uh, implement this and make sure it runs the FreeBSD guest, which I suppose has support for TPM 2.0. And uh, if that works, we just assume it works elsewhere. And if not, that's a bug and can be fixed later. Right. And of course, Windows support is pretty important. Although from a previous conversation, other uses of TPM are fascinating insofar as keys for be it SSH or ZFS, you name it. And if there's anyone present, especially our new attendees who have used TPM in clever ways, I would love to hear those uses. And yes, I try not to corner people too aggressively, but I do want to reach out to topics that people haven't considered or haven't shared ever before. So. Uh, 
uh, even uh, imagining new TPM use cases in Unix and non-Windows environments are helpful in so far as if we have the plumbing to have a virtual machine with a TPM, maybe there are completely non-Windows opportunities for that. So I'd love to just get that message out there. Uh, okay, uh, hit me up with uh, payment information and I'll do some uh, horse trading behind the scene. We'll do that. Awesome. Daniel, do you have any topics? Because we have a new amazing participant to introduce. And uh, so Daniel, anything or shall we just continue? Um, no, I think, uh, yeah, I think I'm just doing some fun stuff with, uh, with, you know, cold or slightly warm tailovers Ooh. and stuff, but but nothing, nothing super exciting. Also, I just threw uh, uh, two hundred and fifty dollars into the change jar for CPM. Sweet, thank you, sir. Um, Everyone, you like Daniel? I wanted to ring up. I don't know whether or not it affects the BSD side, so I wanted to make people aware. Um, Mark and our organization just recently had a patch put in on at least the Illumo side that increases the maximum number of um, VNICs that can be assigned to a VM to 16. I don't know why he needs 16, but it was an itch he had. I don't know if it affects you guys, so I wanted to make sure the UBSD folk were aware. Okay, so is that purely crossbow? I don't know. I'm, okay. I'm not sure. I haven't I haven't seriously looked at it. Cool. So if you've got a link, that's why I don't know if it, if it affects you or not. Can I ask what the use case is? Like I just said, I have no idea <laughs> okay. why he needs that many. But uh, it was grab an a link when you wanted chance. to. Cool. I don't think FreeBSD's Beehive has any specific limitations other than that each virtual NIC requires a PCI device. So at some point you run out of PCI um, devices because it doesn't use uh, functions and so on. It's a full device each time. I don't know if you can even create an, an additional bus namespace to have more devices. Uh, there's definitely no support for emulate for any PCI bridge shenanigans to extend the uh, Namespace. Boom, comments hidden. Okay, cool. Uh, just drop us a link when you find it. Thank you for your patience on the dock. Eva, welcome. You have been a wealth of information on the Fediverse, and it is amazing to meet you in person. Well, somewhat in person. Yeah, nice to meet everyone. In real time. Uh, would yes. you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Ava Wintershin. I'm a principal systems architect at Fastly, and I've been working on pre-production load testing and performance engineering for about seven years over there. Um, and presently we're doing a bunch of private cloud infrastructure that needs to have more FreeBSD in it. And so here I am, but this is not for work, just to clarify. Mm, understood. Uh, so you have had some fascinating questions, such as how, what might be the most efficient way to pass an NVDIM into a VM uh, to use it as, I'm guessing, an acceleration device? Uh, it could be for really any of the uses that the Optanes have, uh, and not the Optane in general, but the NVDIM specifically. Mm -hmm. so in the Linux world, you can have those run as uh, non-volatile mode uh, and then regular volatile mode. And within the non-volatile mode, there's different areas of performance tuning and uh, workloads that, that can excel at. And one of those is specifically around uh, OpenZFS and running the MVGEMs in um, a multi-socket RAID arrangement, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can mirror them and they just show up as regular block level devices, which is really convenient. And um, I would like to transfer that ability over to FreeBSD such that we can 
but we're not going to get the driver from Intel anytime soon, if ever. Um, that's required to run all of the, the tooling that corresponds to those NVDIMs. And so what I'd like to see though, is the ability on a FreeBSD host to use pass through of some nature. Uh, and since they're not PCI devices, they're in the, with the regular DIMM sockets. Uh, you have to possibly refer to them in a different way that pass through maybe doesn't already offer us. And so I'm wondering how we can pass what is effectively a DIMM slot assignment for the NVDIMs over to a virtual machine so that a Linux sure. virtual machine can load the kernel driver and do all of the regular NVDIMM stuff. And that's specifically um, for a Linux guest, is that accurate? Yes, correct. Ah, got it. Um, okay, Jan, it sounds like you had something. So PCI pass-through won't help you because as Correct. you already said, they're not PCI devices. Um, so you would have to tell in some way, just like the real hardware does, that this memory region is somehow special and then the hypervisor has to give the right semantics, but using them as uh, NVDIMs as a durable low latency block device is fraught with peril because the you can have partial updates here because your granularity on a block device is normally at least 512 bytes, but on NVDIMs, it's a cache line. And the cache coherency is different from the persistence. So it can be that a write is not yet visible to another CPU core because it'll be really fucked up beyond belief uh, with the semantics so that just because you have a memory barrier does not, uh, and the write is visible to another CPU does not mean that it's persistent and the other way around. So uh, right. just pretending that this is a block device and putting a file system on it is playing with fire. Well, it sounds like Eva, you're using NVDIMs currently in production okay. some form. Now they're online. Works have, they, have they bitten you in any way or they're treating you just fine? Uh, for FreeBSD, they're just fine, uh, okay. but they only run in volatile mode. So they just look like regular RAM. So if it's if it just looks like regular RAM, uh, passing that through to the guest should be relatively trivial. I mean, as long as the uh, host OS knows where that region of physical memory is, that is the NVIDIA, you could write an interface in Beehive that would get a chunk out of that or all of it and uh, map it into a VM, just like it does with reg regular memory, except that you usually don't care about where that memory is in case of regular memory. Well, I want to expose the like an entire NVIDIA to yeah. the virtual machine so that it can see it as if it were the non-volatile implementation. The right. thing about NVDIMs, I've just opened up the Wikipedia page on it. So if I understand correctly, this is just uh, a chunk of physical memory. There's no special registers, anything on PCI or that, that you um, could access. It's just memory that happens to be non-volatile. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Uh, that's part of it. The real problem is you have to have barriers so that you uh, are able to say this store has to happen before this store, and is this store already durable? So that there are special instructions and they work on a cache line granularity. That's not different where you run in a VM or on a host, right? Uh, so those that's, that's, those that's, instructions that's... may not work from inside a virtual machine care about what, whatever that is, whether it's a file system or whatever it's running on top of it. But um, accessing it as a as a device from a driver perspective is just, okay, here's this chunk of memory in the physical address range, and that is the NVIDIA. Is that correct? It's not correct. So if, if, if that's the case, if it's really just a, a certain um, address range and a physical um, memory then it, I suppose well, it depends on how the drivers are it, one at a time we have latency issues. Go ahead, uh, Eva. I was saying that it depends on how the Intel driver on Linux would want to see that hardware because it is reading something that separates it from 
standard RAM, right? I have both of these types of RAMs in, in the computer and the servers and such, right? They have standard volatile ones and then the non-volatile ones. And when you boot up, you go into the BIOS, you can see all the different features and so forth and change things. Um, but once Linux loads the driver, it offers, um, it exposes some amount of hardware flags that I don't have the most detail on. And then the Intel has some tools that allow you to manipulate the exposed hardware in different ways uh, for the non-volatileness, right? And if you don't have that kernel driver and you don't have the tooling, then there's nothing to say about the RAM other than that it is also like volatile RAM, right? So there's there's some parts on the Linux side that, um, that I think maybe we would need more information about. And I can, um, I can send Intel and uh, a ticket on the support so side. Is, is the, the driver in Linux, is that open source? Can we take a look at that, or is that some some blob that Intel provides? And... It's certainly downloadable. I have to see if it's open source or not. <sighs> and on that point, I know TrueNAS Core is shipping with NVDIMs and has for several years, and Alexander Moulton had to untangle all that. So in theory, there's some amount of NVDIM support in FreeBSD. Can I upstream it... that? Uh, that's a very good question. Hence my question in the doc. Uh, yes, Andrew. Can I interject a less technical and more practical question here? Um, is any is has someone taken up the mantle of producing these things? Because Intel has deprecated their product. They're not producing anymore. Oh, like Optane? <laughs> yeah, Optane is no more. And what they, about they've NVIDIA? killed that product okay. line. Uh, if I remember correctly, there are still those which are not flashback with a big capacitor, so that on power loss they dump the DRAM to uh, flash. Those I think have a startup cost because they, during boot up, they have to kind of block erase the uh, flash so that it's pre erased to accept a quick dump, so that they don't have to erase the flash. So. So they may slow down the boot, but other than that, mm -hmm. well, those uh, are other ones you really want perf for performance because uh, they are no slower than normal uh, ECC registered memory, so that you have like 150 nanosecond uh, latency or thereabout. Whereas an obtain is while faster than non flash, right? It's still slower than DRAM. Could somebody make a million dollars by licensing 3DX points and making an HBA that has a couple of those things built into it? Because it's just like, it's like the best, it's the best log ZFS log device that has ever existed. What about things <laughs> like a Zoiswam, which is just capacitor uh, and non flashbacked uh, DRAM? It's like dual 12 gig. Uh, SAS and then so that it and those things are actually designed to yep. be written to via both HPA ports. And Sun had their You're car. saying it's on a battery? It's a battery or it's a big capacitor bank, which is large enough to dump the DRAM to flash on power loss so that you have uh, mm. years of power loss protection, not just hours. And the big advantage of using this instead of NAND or 3DX point flash-like technologies is that you have normal DRAM write uh, performance. And yes, you have to trust the device that the firmware will do its one important task correctly. But so do you, you have to trust any kind of flash relabling, so. Okay, let's keep it actionable. So uh, Eva, if you can look into Intel's offer of source, that would be great. I will try to find the NVDM I picked up on eBay six months ago. And uh, if anyone else has hardware use cases or even motherboards that will accept such things, maybe let us know insofar as we can do some science. Um, and right off the bat, if it shows up as a block device, the host OS, I'm guessing you can just make it like a... <laughs> G avert IO you know, block device, and it's not very exciting, but it might 
show up and work. Go ahead. Oh, I was saying I have extra hardware if anyone needs some testing, some remote testing functions. That So, is awesome. yeah, we can allocate some hardware and the colo for this if anyone wants to work on it with me. I will make a note in the minutes. Anything else on that topic? Uh, so uh, putting my talk where my mouth is or something, whatever the saying is, uh, I demonstrated uh, FreeBSD ARM Occam BSD last Friday, and I got my little scripts working to say build a minimum ZFS image for FreeBSD, Eva, that grabbed your attention. And you had a suggestion on the Fediverse of, well, what would a pre-built VM repo look like? That's come up over the years on the calls. Uh, what ecosystems have you do you consider successful that we might want to model it something after we go down that road? Oh, as far as modeling after that, I was thinking it would be pretty useful to spin up some um, like some Fugier instances that can build all of these images for us uh, on a routine basis, just with standard automation, and then host those using a uh, certificate managed package repo. And then people could be able to pull those down when they're creating new hosts. <clears throat> um, um, so they don't have to come finish in the way that we usually do. One technology which, while it's a bit much of a dependency, but IPFS handles this really nicely because its content mm -hmm. uh, is self um, signing because you have. Link to a specific content hash, and then it's a yeah, it works like an old fashioned uh, peer to peer uh, application, but you can pin stuff locally so that you have a cache among your nodes. So it really does a replicate uh, blobs, uh, authenticate blobs, but allow someone else to moderate that. Functionalities built in. Hmm. Uh, what killer apps have you seen for IPFS? Um, among others, this linking to content someone else hosts, so hmm. that the one who does the moderation is not uh, burdened with the bandwidth and storage costs for all the virtual machines. Hmm. Instead, if because it's a, it works kind of like BitTorrent plus uh, linking. Hmm. Uh, now, I have my reasons for Occam BSD, but those are mine. Uh, Eva, what grabs your attention with a tool to make really small FreeBSD deployments? Oh, well, let me rephrase that question from the. Please. Opinion. Uh, for the pre-built VM repo, I was thinking we would use uh, Occam BSD to do that, and we mm -hmm. would uh, effectively just um, expand on that project so that when people are using Occam BSD, you know, a big part of that is pulling down the versions and doing the compiling and packaging up the um, the image files for later use. And so I would want to see that the outcome of that process created as packages so that people could pull down a virtual machine package that's ready to go. Ah, and then it. that would be handled in like a matrix of uh, different architectures, different um, versions of the OSs and so forth and so forth. So we would have pre-built ones that are already ready for people to use. Uh, do you, can you name a, 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 what would be the first packaged VM that you would install? I probably I don't really like having to say this, but I anything to reduce the amount of time I have to spend using Ubuntu is a good thing. And so if I have to use Ubuntu VMs for any reason, I don't want to see them building anywhere. I don't want to I want to minimize my time with it. And so having those already ready to spin up really quickly. Yep. Are there really, what yeah. what are some I, of those applications? I know a lot of them. Be like that What's well. keeping you on Ubuntu, if I may? Oh, we don't need to get into the politics oh. of Ubuntu. <laughs> no, but do, is there some 
app? Like what, what do you sit down and need that's not easily accessible in FreeBSD, be it in jail or otherwise? Oh, I see. Uh, it's more for um, infrastructure automation Okay. purpose, uh, corporate stuff. Carpet stuff. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Um, thank you. Well, I'm all ears. Uh, so yeah, that that's a heck So, of a little project that took a decade regarding to make. packages, Go ahead, Jan. um, did I understand you correctly that you want to have a FreeBSD package manager package repository, not something packages, but specifically FreeBSD packages? Yes. Package, add, <laughs> Nginx, um, um, hypothetically, so right? for jail images, of full user lens and so on, I looked into what's possible with the FreeBSD package tooling. And it's basically the same thing for uh, virtual machines, just that you have additional options for using block devices. So for learning, there is a functionality in uh, FreeBSD's package manager called triggers, which allows one package to install a trigger, which is a little UCL file, which includes a Lua script uh, and uh, rec um, globbing patterns. And whenever a package installs, which matches this globbing pattern on some file, this trigger is called. So you can use this to do things when something is installed in a directory, for example, then you install a font, your X font cache is updated automatically. Or um, if some application installs an icon, the icon cache for uh, X3 desktop stuff is updated. You could also use this to do something when a virtual machine is installed uh, as a package image to then register it. For layering on top the versions, if you're willing to commit to ZFS and to making it um, unrebasable, you could use clever tricks with just having packages of ZFS replication streams. You would then, uh, with a post install hook, put into some configured location so that you would basically install the stream, do a package uh, post install trigger, which would then receive all the replication stream and delete the file so that it basically consumes the file from in the package so that you can, can automate things because the pre and post install hooks can be arbitrary shell scripts or uh, FreeBSD specific Lua scripts. which both can invoke arbitrary commands as root. So you can get fancy there and all do it through the um, through the interface of a package install the install to import a package into your virtual machine repository locally or your cache or whatever you want to call it. It's probably important to get Your terminology right here. Hmm. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm doing. I'm trying to do Um, this internally, but it's not. But it's there's a. I mean, this could this be a community thing? Because I mean, the security implications would be for virtual machines. Infinite. Yes, you can do. <laughs> Infinite. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, security implications. Uh, and what? How far have you gotten with that, Daniel? It sounds like you've hit a few walls. Uh. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's not it's 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 not that fancy. I use my in-house replication tool to so I basically have, you know, my staff creates a stable of of VMs, so Debian versions, Ubuntu, Windows server, and so on. And then those replicate to some, but not all of my data centers. So then they're they're sort of readily available to just to either either clone or Or, or ZF, ZFS send, and I can deploy, I mean, obviously a clone, you can deploy 50 in five seconds, but, you know, but between, between hosts, you know, it's just gonna uh, sync up at local network speed and, and things are, things are ready to go pretty, pretty quickly. So, I mean, it's nothing special. It's just, you know, a central, central repository. It syncs all the snapshots. And then I actually, I use, VMB Hive is built in uh, handy ZFS tools. So VM, so yeah, my staff, they type VM space clone space deb 12 space, whatever they're making. 
and then boom, they have a, you know, whatever dumb appliance, uh, whatever commercial appliance they, they need to install. Uh, we have, we have Linux available to, to do it. Um, and then they can do the same thing at, uh, at my hosts and other data centers as well. So, and of course, you know, it's just moving the deltas around. So it's a nice, you know, it's a nice stream of, uh, of bits without, without ever getting too heavy. Hmm, cool. Um, but of course, you know, the overhead to, to turn that into something that I can fully trust internally with no password on SSH and blah, blah, blah. That's, that's easy. Making this community friendly would be, uh, exciting. <laughs> I mean, I would love to, I would love to be a part of such a project, but, uh, I, I think the security uh, situation could be could be difficult, and then we're making Docker, and then, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, like uh, I don't I don't know if I want to do that. Uh, so the next thing is what Freebie is a bit special about FreeBSD is that the tar we have is a wrapper around Lib Archive, which can do lots of things, uh, which go beyond normal tar. So here the question is. How precisely do you want your imaging to be? Do you need a bit identical uh, image of the block device, or are you fine with creating a volume and, and unpacking a tar archive, um, or even just installing a package set from a custom uh, package repository, similar to how package base works, uh, and then? Um, doing the initial configuration with your own custom packages. Or the ZFS and, send stream. Yeah, that's the ZFS send stream is the closest you can get to a bit identical file system. Um, because for example, unpacking a tar may result in different performance characteristics depending on how you virtually have your thin provision storage. Oh, good point. Um, hmm. Lays it out. So, one time you may get a good layout, another time a terrible layout. And hmm. if, if you just DD out the full file system image, just a raw file sequentially, you can almost guarantee you're getting reasonable layouts in your virtual storage every time. Of course, you're now you have a thick instead of a thin provision storage. It's a question of how, what do you need? How precise do you want to be? Right. Uh, other ideas, clever approaches, or success stories from other ecosystems we can draw upon because you know, we don't want to invent completely new, I don't know, terminology for people because that makes it very difficult to communicate. Sure. The other, one of the important questions, I think, is do you want internal or external management? So do you want the host to do everything or do you want the host to only bootstrap something and then do, for example, an automated package install inside a virtual machine to install the right custom package set with package base. Mm-hmm. Uh, then, because then the build instruction can be very small and you can reuse the official um, 3DSD package base. And um, regarding trusted stuff and package base, I have this little article where I wrote, uh, wrote down my hacks. Mm-hmm. Uh, on how to um, how to cache something from the FreeBSD package CDN locally with oh, Vanish yeah. so oh, that cool. your package install runs at 10 gig or more, whatever your local network is, um, while still validating every cache hit. So using the e tags from the upstream so that you don't burn through lots of CDN bandwidth on the, the side of the FreeBSD project by prototyping stuff. And yeah, every is yeah. Exactly. Cool. Uh, yes. and you do. Yeah. Um, the problem here is that this configuration I came up with is a bit overly uh, careful because it always uses the e tag on every cache hit to ask the upstream if the cache hit is still correct. If you're, right. if you're willing to risk a false cache hit, then you can uh, 
do the cache invalidation asynchronous and get a lot better latency for small packages. Here, if you have a one kilobyte package, you still wait for the CDN to reply instead mm. of just the local stuff. Right. But the advantage of the way I did it is that you can trust it, that it will never return a corrupted, out of date, stale package to you because it uses cool. the e tag, which basically checks size and m time on the upstream. And Eva, you commented OpenStack has some shared terminology, which would be useful. Yes, thank you. Oh, that's a valid point. I'll just drop it right in there. Um, cool. And if we need to test on any of this private cloud stuff architecture that I have, uh, OpenStack is one of the ones that's in the mix. So, got it. Um, pretty much the majority of the high level uh, hypervisor infrastructures. I have access to those on my own equipment that's in the colo. So I am happy to contribute as much hardware and time as we need. So very, very cool. That said, um, show of hands, it sounds like Emil, you're presenting at your BSD con. I am scheduled to present. Jan, will you be there? I have a ticket. Uh, I have, have a ticket. To book my flights. Cool. Uh, Jan, Hans, Eva, if I may, I would love to, you know, last year we did a Beehive hackathon just because there's so much Beehive content on the schedule already. It's sort of redundant to have a Beehive con, but uh, I would love to talk about these topics in person and the more planning in advance, the more effective we can be. So let this be a cordial invitation to those who are not already scheduled. <clears throat> so we have covered some great ground. Any other topics that are hot on your minds? So so on uh, the previous comment about yes. uh, topic of, uh, around packaging and such, yes. I'm, one, one of the things that I think is missing from the ecosystem is a packer driver. And it's something that I have on my back burner to, to, to help write. Uh, I'm curious whether other people think that that's a missing component as well. Uh, is that a HashiCorp thing? Yeah. Ah, are there any Packer users within reach? Uh, okay, I've answered it. Well, oh, hold on. Jan's found a... An a, out of date about... Packer template to build free BSD images from years ago. Okay. Um, Probably suffered bit run over the years. So there is a link Mark to take a look at. And so is that like, okay, FreeBSD is a second class citizen in Packerland? No, I, what, what, I, what I'm commenting on is having a Beehive driver such that you can build these images using Beehive. Instead of ah. virtual box. Mm, that's a good oh, idea. Well, interesting. Got it. Oh, now, thank you for clarifying. Uh, to skip using and they're using VirtualBox, not QEMU. Interesting. Interesting. They did historically because it's the common desktop virtualization platform. Mm, sure. Okay. I, so, I suppose. It, at least they used to, uh, similar to Varnish, but hey. Yeah, this is like, like like I said, I, I I think that there's an opportunity to have a beehive specific driver. Hmm. Well, I hear some vaguely positive grunts on that topic. Here we go. Init. Uh, do start here and let us know what you find. Um, yeah, I'm I'm an in base kind of person, but I totally see how there's a need for such things. Um, and Andrew, was it your Mark who did Nifty Vagrant Acrobatics with your Lumos um, environment? Yeah. I think I just stumbled over a plugin to make use of Beehive. Uh, from, so maybe it exists already for uh, SmartOS? Okay. I'll have to take a look at it. Thanks. I just dropped the link. Yeah, I see that. I'm and dropping. it has even I'm seen dropping. commits within the last year, so. Cool. They still work. 
Uh, we look forward to your executive summary. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, note Mark G's work in the minutes. Yeah, those those links to GitHub for Mark G are definitely in there from uh, from Andrew's company. So, other questions, topics, ideas, T-shirt ideas. It, there's a lot going on and things are landing right, left and center. And I'll just throw this out there. If you have any development ability to help out with um, FreeBSD and let's just, sure, Lumos on Apple Silicon. Uh, that's been a kind of back burner project for Kyle Evans and Kyle explained some of the issues that have to happen. But now that I see how ridiculously fast that hardware can be, it's a bit strange that only Alpine Linux and uh, Asahi and OpenBSD are seemingly the first class clients there. There I said it. The problem is that you have to raise a lot of developer resources with reverse engineering Apple hardware. Fortunately, our friends at Asahi have done a lot of that and we can coach exactly. Uh, but even to reach the same level of Asahi. It's would really be impressive easy. what they've done. Yes. And um, what are what this level of enthusiasm and commitment could have improved less hostile hardware as well. Hmm, but okay. hey, there of is course, it. just porting, yeah, like it's, it is one of the fastest way to run ARM virtual machines. If you uh, it's probably the fastest if you worry about single thread performance. Ampara may have lots of cores, but the individual cores aren't that fast. Yes, and there are far more corner stores selling them than say this orange pie that just um, arrived. I'm still trying to figure out which image is appropriate for it. So and, uh, is anyone for... familiar with the uh, sorry personal BSD? on that very topic, because they're like, hey, there are the official images from FreeBSD and then there's personal BSD images and I don't know much about them and I'm a little nervous. Yes. I've been working yes. with them periodically. Um, yes. I feel a little bad because I haven't been on Telemark or Telemark, Telegram in forever, which is where they seem to hang out most of the time. Ah. Uh, but they have um, some efforts around porting FreeBSD to various embedded systems running on ARM. And last I was talking to them, they were building out ARM packages for GhostBSD and um, the NanoPi R6S was in development, uh, missing some drivers for the E, uh, was it the EMMC? Mm -hmm. A few other networking things. I have a couple of those boxes all scattered around here for testing, ah. but yeah, they're, they're an interesting team to work with. And um, I hopefully we'll get more time with them as well. Okay, and uh, so while he's a busy person, uh, Colin Percival is a delightful, open-minded person and is now the release engineer such that if there are opportunities for official images that are mutually agreed upon, like, hey, why we should support X, Y, and Z, it takes these steps to make them and shouldn't be too intrusive, I say we, we look at those opportunities. There, I said it. And if you want, I can uh, look up the list of things uh, Kyle Evans mentioned for Apple Silicon. But hey, I don't know, uh, Hans, if you're, say, into PCI and drivers, that's also an opportunity. It has to happen, in my biased opinion. So other topics, questions, ideas, t-shirt ideas. Uh, if you check out the Hackathon doc, it has now 20 or so God awful t shirt suggestions. Well, I will call that five, six, eighteen hundred UTC, it sounds like. Uh, anything else, or shall we call it a day and uh, move on to next week? It is so good to meet some of you uh, synchronously after all this time. Well, that said, who wants Thanks, the Andrew. honors? And we have the, uh, as a reminder to everybody, we have the uh, uh, OpenZFS 
meetup happening and invites are open for, or for that. This uh -huh. is true. That, Sign up I, is open for that. Not always seeing the forest from the trees. Uh, the Open ZFS user and developer summit indeed went live Tuesday. So all are invited. Thank you, Andrew, for reminding me of something that's like under my nose. That said, who wants the honors? Like and subscribe. I, thank you, sir. Okay, well, great. I'll be around in a few minutes, and I wish you a great day and uh, weekend. Thank you, Eva. Thanks. See you next time.